And you look great in that blue, blue. Thank you. <laughs> so we're getting ready to body. Okay. Oh, wow. I don't know what happened there. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. I'm so excited to bring Dr. Jagwe back, one of our very own, who um, was the chief of dentistry at Howard University for over two decades, and um, who is in private practice and also do medical missions to Nigeria, to different states actually in Nigeria. Um, many who know Dr. Jagwe knows that he loves to um, just share knowledge and improve our knowledge in um, different spheres, especially in dentistry, but not just in dentistry, everywhere. So I am a family practitioner. I also treat HIV and substance use disorder in Maryland. And I'm excited to hear what um, awaits us tonight. Surprises again. Dr. Jagwe, the floor is yours, sir. Welcome, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. O. Um, uh, tonight's topic may be a little bit uh, complicated for some, but if you, if you follow the way I'll be presenting it, you might be able to see how easy it is to actually understand. Uh, the topic tonight is integrating maternal and child oral health understanding the impact of lifestyle choices and habits. Um, so since uh, Medical Mondays with Dr. O began, we've been talking about preventive measures, uh, saying that uh, a healthy lifestyle for healthy future. And the same thing goes into the, into the arena of the interaction between maternal and child oral health. So tonight, um, I'm glad that you could join me in, uh, uh, you know, tonight as we delve into this fascinating topic of integrating maternal and child oral health. So I want to take this opportunity to shed light uh, on the negative effect of lifestyle choices and habits on oral health. I believe it is crucial to understand how uh, everyday choices can impact not only our own dental well being, but also that of our children, at least for those who have children. Uh, you know, you find out at some point that uh, it doesn't just stop between mothers and their, and their children, but it also affects other older you know, caregivers, including grandparents, aunts and uh, uncles, and anyone who acts as a caregiver to children. So let's start by discussing lifestyle choices uh, and their influence on oral health. So when we talk about lifestyle choices, we are referring to things like our diet, uh, tobacco use, alcohol consumption, uh, you know, chemical dependency, you know, I mean, using uh, uh, drugs um, that are not prescribed, uh, things like methamphetamine, and all of these things uh, do have negative uh, effects on the oral uh, health of those who uh, practice such bad habits. So one of the major culprits affecting oral health is our love also for sugary, um, sugary foods and beverages. I'm sure you know how ubiquitous that is everywhere we turn. Everything that we, you know, that's been processed has some sugar added. We've talked about this at length at several, you know, on several occasions on Medical Mondays as regards the, you know, the addition of uh, 
uh, high fructose corn syrup to almost everything that is being bought, you know, uh, from the uh, fast food to canned food to uh, all the processed food that we, you know, buy as part of our, our nutritional uh, uh, tribe. So, um, so we need to be mindful of how much of the sugary, uh, you know, food and beverages that we consume because on the long run, it, they do have some impacts on the oral health uh, of the consumers. Now let's shift our focus to tobacco use. I'm sure, you know, you, we've seen many people who you can swear by the fact that they've been smoking for 40 years and they, they are not, no uh, negative effect has been observed in their lives and they don't see any reason why they should quit. Well, we, uh, just to help them understand that smoking and chewing tobacco can wreak havoc on, oral, on, on anybody's oral health when they are used over time. Uh, they increase the risk of gum disease, number one, and they also uh, lead to premature uh, tooth losses and uh, even oral cancer. So we've had cases of people who you know, chew tobacco for a long time or snuff dipping the deep snuff uh, under the tongue and some put their snuff on, on, the, top, on the dorsum of their tongue. And over time, uh, the lining of the mouth eventually changes and they lead to precancerous or overt cancer uh, in the mouth. So another lifestyle choice uh, we need to address is the excessive alcohol consumption. Uh, for, you know, people, almost everybody that drinks alcohol um, occasionally, you know, uh, during ceremonies or not a habitual alcoholic, uh, may not observe certain uh, deleterious or adverse effects of uh, excessive alcohol consumption. Uh, in excessive alcohol consumption, uh, you know, there is a dry mouth, uh, the mouth dries out because, uh, you know, there's a reduction in uh, saliva production in people that drink alcohol a lot. And that prevents, I mean, the, uh, the saliva that actually has protective uh, uh, influence on the teeth and the gums being deprived from coming in, I mean, being uh, present in the mouth because of the alcohol consumption uh, actually predisposes the, uh, the alcoholic to tooth decay and gum diseases because not only is their mouth dry, they also have uh, poor oral hygiene habits which exacerbates the uh, oral health issues that they confront. So, um, let's move on to another habit, you know, the habit on, uh, you know, uh, you know, maintaining good oral hygiene and, and that in itself is where we are in, that's our goal. We want to move everybody in that direction that there will be excellent oral hygiene practices and so that the teeth and the gums and the overall oral health can be preserved. How do we do this? We do this by regular brushing, flossing, uh, visiting dentists uh, on a regular basis. We propose that it should be like twice uh, every year, once every six months, at least to get a checkup. Uh, this will be proactive way of preventing, uh, you know, bad outcomes in terms of oral health uh, situation. So another thing that we need to uh, think about is the, uh, the pacifier usage in uh, newborns or infants. Uh, we all know that pacifiers are commonly used to soothe infants, uh, but it's important to be aware of the potential negative effect they can have on oral health. So what happens when there is prolonged or excessive use of pacifier? This can lead to, um, to problems with the alignment of the teeth and the development of the jaws. Um, the tongue is very, very important in the development of the jaws, as well as the alignment of the teeth. 
uh, pacifiers, particularly when it's excessively used or used uh, for a long period of time, actually causes the tongue to be low set. The tongue usually is supposed to be on the roof of the mouth at rest, there with the pacifier occupying the space, the tongue is kept in the floor of the mouth. And this affects everything that the infant is exposed to uh, from feeding to the growth of the tongue and to the growth of the jaws. So we need to be mindful of this. Uh, if we know anyone who has uh, neonates and they constantly give pacifiers, we need to encourage them as uh, caregivers, or pro, you know, um, healthcare providers, that this should be used very sparingly, and they should not continue to use this indefinitely as a, a way of just keeping the child quiet. Uh, the jaw development and the tongue development are very, very important for the future of that of that child. So we need to be mindful of that. Um, there is another habit that has a very negative consequence, and that is uh, the habit of a mother. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I've seen it almost everywhere I go, particularly in public places. Uh, when uh, a child's, a baby's uh, pacifier drops to the ground, the mother picks it up, uh, not having water or anything to clean it, they will wipe it on their, uh, on their outfit and then put it in their mouth. Uh, all in the, you know, I guess the mind, the, what they had in mind was just to use their own saliva to clean the pacifier before shoving it back into the mouth of the baby. Unfortunately, they are not uh, very, you know, cognizant of the danger of what they have done. Uh, the bacteria from the ground uh, compounding with the bacteria from the mother's mouth can actually make the situation worse for the baby. Not only that, most of the mothers that do stuff like this, actually many of them have very poor hygiene already. So they are introducing very strong virulent, when we use the word virulent, that means a very dangerous bacteria into the mouth of the neonate. Well, the teeth, that, the baby teeth that would just come up, you know exactly what's gonna happen. The, the strong bacteria from the adult now begins to attack the baby teeth. The baby teeth are very weak and very small within a very short time, combined with the sugary uh, snacks that they give to their babies and drinks, you can imagine what the outcome is. Uh, if you've seen some baby's mouth at the age of about three, four, all the front teeth are already rotten. Uh, you can imagine a baby having about, you know, uh, six teeth with big cavities and each of them being infected. Uh, this is not a very good uh, outcome, uh, you know, when we look at the integration of the oral health and the, uh, between the, ma the mother and the child. Uh, so as we explore this, we need to start connecting you know, we need to integrate the, the oral health care of the mother uh, with the child, uh, with the child's. So let's see how that begins. When a child is being, you know, in the womb, it is important for the expectant mothers to be very, very cognizant and be very careful about their lifestyle choices. Uh, eating, I mean, having very good diet is imperative. If they want a healthy babies, if they want their babies to be healthy at birth. Um, we found that there are many mothers, or expectant mothers who have very poor hygiene and very, you know, have very high risk of uh, developing cavities and gum disease uh, may actually have miscarriages because uh, there's been studies that connect uh, poor hygiene, gum diseases to, uh, you know, premature termination of pregnancies or even leading to low birth weight. And, uh, you know, for babies that are born, you know, still birth, uh, you know, all of these things 
are connected to the oral health of the mother, of the expectant mother. So for the baby to come out healthy, the mother has to eat well, has to have good oral hygiene. And also the teeth or the oral structures begin to form uh, at, a, at about the fourth week of pregnancy. Most, most women may not even know that they were pregnant at that point because it's the first month uh, you know, when they probably will begin to observe that they are, you know, they, they are not, their menstruation cycle or menstrual cycle is halted. Uh, and so they begin to figure out what is happening. They do pregnancy tests at that point. At that point in the fourth week, the mouth is beginning to form. So any adverse, you know, uh, choices, any, any bad choices on the part of the mother, whether it is through uh, tobacco smoking or alcohol use or drug use, will have a very lasting impact on the development of that fetus. Uh, we've had, you know, for alcoholics, we've had about uh, babies born with special, you know, with some kind of features that is termed uh, chronic alcoholic syndrome or fetal alcoholic syndrome that is found in babies with certain features. So we need to bear it in mind that when we see pregnant women, we need to encourage them to, uh, to engage in um, healthy habits, not just for nutritional purposes, but also for the health of their developing of babies as well as their future um, her oral health as is concerned. So to ensure or you know optimal oral health for both mothers and children, it is essential to integrate maternal and child oral health care. Well, what does this really look like? Uh, this means that there should be a collaboration between the dental health care providers, the health care professionals, as well as, you know, education and awareness programs for the mothers and the, and the caregivers. So it is this collaborative uh, effort that actually, you know, by emphasizing the importance of oral health within the families and communities that we can actually uh, ensure that the, the future generations are well taken care of. So um, I hope you have been able to follow the way I'm presenting it. I, you know, I don't want to use too many big words, but I hope that uh, I've been able to uh, share some things that will actually open uh, the floor for questions so that we can expand, expantiate on many of these things uh, uh, if need be. So in conclusion to my presentation, I, was, I would like to say that integrating maternal and child oral health is crucial for a healthy and vibrant society. So we have explored the negative effects of lifestyle choices and habits on oral health. We have emphasized the importance of uh, making informed choices and adopting healthy habits. Uh, so by prioritizing oral health, we can create a positive impact on the well-being of both mothers and children. So remember, a healthy smile goes a long way. So I think everybody should be smiling now because a healthy smile goes a long way. Thank you for your attention, and I am happy to answer any question that you may have. Thank you so much, sir. That was fantastic. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> or I don't know if it's a question or maybe a comment to add. You know, when sure. you say that mothers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when it pacifier drops or something like that, they would take it and mm -hmm. leave it uh, in the pro process of cleaning it out before give, putting it back in the child's mouth. Mm -hmm. Just, in, of mothers who have herpes type one, exactly so for cold sores. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. lots of people have cold sores, and we know that 
research has shown, statistics show that at least 70% of the world population, including children, have cold sore. They have herpes. And the children, the babies, they get it from adults. But I always thought it is, you know, like, you know, when adults kiss babies, I hate it. I hate seeing it. In fact, I've told mothers and fathers, stop kissing the baby. Leave the baby alone. Because when somebody has herpes, mm -hmm. type, cold sore, even type 2, the genital, they shed every month. And they don't know that they're shedding the virus. They don't know what time they are shedding it. They don't feel it. They don't know. During the time they are shedding, they infect others, but they don't know they're doing that. Okay. It is when their immunity is down for whatever reason that they actually break out in those sores that we say, oh, they have cold sores. So a lot of people actually have cold sores that don't know. And so as you were speaking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is freaking me out. Because somebody has cold sore, they shed in, they don't know, licked this pacifier and then put it back in the mouth. Oh, Lord God Almighty, it is, uh, it, it. thank you so much. I, I don't I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know well, to say. yeah, that is unfortunate. But see, those mothers, if you confronted them that what they were doing was not right, of course, they will tell you to mind your business, that you can't teach them how to take care of their babies. So, well, that's where um, education and public aware, you know, uh, awareness campaign will be very, very good. Uh, unfortunately, when the, the mothers, you know, me expectant mothers go for uh, prenatal checkups, they don't usually have a dental consultation, you know, when they do that. Um, so many of them will not see a dentist unless they have, you know, emergency. And so when they have emergency, they're now going to focus on or, you know, any of the habits that they have. So, you know, yes, it's a very big problem. And a lot of children from the so-called low, uh, lower economic uh, strata always come to, I mean, always have very high incidence of decay, as well as premature losses of their baby teeth, which will then complicate their life, you know, as they get older. So this is a big thing. Uh, the, uh, this topic is very important. And uh, of course, it will be a, a good thing to collaborate with uh, neonatologists, uh, you know, pediatricians, you know, and be able to help, you know, uh, mitigate this kind of uh, a trend. I see that in the dental office, you know, when you see a, a, a four-year-old that has eight teeth that are infected, that's bad news. That child cannot sleep well at night. I mean, that child cannot pay attention in school. I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, they are having toothache. And if they cry too much, people are going to say they are crybaby. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle that it's very difficult to break. And uh, the mothers will not see themselves as being the, uh, the protagonist in this case or the cause of the problem. Uh, because you even talk to them, they say, leave me alone. I know how to take care of my baby. Anyways, thank you for raising that up. Uh, yes, it's a big problem. Mm. It's huge. Thank you so much. You started the awareness. You just, I mean, alerted us to those facts. So I have a question in the chat box by Dr. Alu. Um, <laughs> she said, he said, are the use of braces healthy in children? Well, um, I don't know, you know, what uh, the basis of the question is, but the straightforward answer is if the child needs it, yes, it has to be. <laughs> if the child doesn't need it, then there is no basis for giving uh, braces to a little child. Um, for a child to have crowding or misalignment of teeth, 
very early it means the problem is not just starting, you know, uh, there. It started from the, the womb. And not only that, the fact that the baby is on pacifier and the tongue is not doing what it's supposed to do to grow the jaw uh, is going to create that kind of crowding for a little child. Uh, most of the time, we do not give braces to children uh, <clears throat> less than four years old in most cases. Uh, when they are given braces, they are given, um, you know, fixed braces that are not like the adults own. We put things like uh, arch expanders that actually open the jaw up and helps to grow the jaw uh, to get to the, uh, you know, to the full potential. So braces, there are different kinds of braces, but if the question is talking about the wire braces that you see in many uh, teenagers and adults, uh, yes, we will not give that to little child uh, or to little children um, even before the age of six. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sister Umi Kamsin, kindly, yeah, you're muted. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I, I didn't even know I was on mute. I, I oh, unmuted and I was typing. Um, I just wanted to, if you can shed more light into the, um, what you talked about shedding with people that have um, um, cold sores. Happy, happy. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. So research in the research labs, um, it is possible to detect when one is shedding the virus. Shedding means that um, the virus, herpes is a virus. It multiplies, you know, at a certain time in the month. So during, in the research setting, we've been able to identify this and identify when. But unfortunately, we don't have tests that are available for, you know, clinic settings or hospitals um, to check when this is occurring. We do know it occurs. The person that has it does not know. Even the genital herpes type two is the same thing. Some people have it. They've never had those sores in the genital area, so they don't know they have it. And if, if they have intercourse with someone during their shedding time, they would infect that person. That person now, if their immunity is low for whatever reason, then they will break out. They'll have the herpes break out. So unless we do the testing, then we don't know who has it or who don't. And there is blood test now to test for both type one and type two. And we also see type one in the genital area because of oral sex. So if somebody has it in the mouth and they do oral sex, then they can um, infect their partner in the genital area during that time of the month when they are shedding. Am I clear? I don't know how to. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah, I just never heard of shedding before. So I just wanted to understand more about it. So thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Ajagwe, for all you do. You're welcome. And uh, Dr. O for the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the way from California. That's my sis. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Dr. Alu, thanks you, Dr. Jagwe, for the deep. Welcome. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? I don't think I missed anything. Yes, I do. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Buka. <laughs> yeah, to um, Dr. Agwe, Dr. Professor, thank you very much, as usual. And we also see a lot of bad teeth with people who put the kids to sleep with their bottles. You know, that's a lifestyle that they, they come to have their all their front teeth extracted. And <laughs> one other question, I'm glad you came up. I told my dentist I use baking soda and, and peroxide. And she said, am I getting fluoride, you know, fluoride? Mm -hmm. So I said, I needed to text you. How do I get fluoride? Do I need more fluoride in my old age? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I don't want to knock your dentist. Um, but 
you know, fluoride as an adult, you really, any fluoride that you're taking is not going to be incorporated in your teeth. So that is, it's almost just like uh, overkill. If you are used, if you are cleaning your teeth normally, uh, you have very good oral hygiene, you don't really need any additive. And that's why I tell people, uh, if you know what you are cleaning, definitely you just go for what you are cleaning and you don't need to do anything extra. So all you wanna get rid of is plaque when you brush your teeth, right? Adding fluoride, fluoride can help children, okay? Uh, if, if a child swallows some fluoride and they put fluoride in uh, multivitamin drops for babies, it is good if this um, fluoride is incorporated in the tooth structure. So if it is not incorporated in the tooth structure, it's basically an overkill. It's just, it's just something you're applying like a Band-Aid. Uh, you, you can be using Band-Aid even when you don't have a wound. You know what I mean? It could be a dresser for you. <laughs> but uh, the point is this. I would have not used anything with fluoride. I'm a dentist for the past 20 years. So I, I don't see why I need fluoride for me. All right. That for those who do not have good oral hygiene, uh, fluoride seems to help, you know, uh, kind of mitigating the plaque accumulation. Okay. So we try to use that, assume, assuming that there's remineralization occurring in some children's teeth or in children's teeth when you, you remove the, the problem of uh, uh, plaque as well as anything that is causing them to develop cavity quickly. Yes, you can reduce it in children, but you cannot do too much with adults. <laughs> so I, I always smile when I see toothpaste and they load it with fluoride and uh, everybody say, oh yeah, you have to buy fluoride toothpaste. I just smile because really, as far as I'm concerned, it's not doing anything for me as an adult. I don't think it would do anything for you as an adult. Uh, your your teeth have already been um, your your teeth have already formed, and if you're going to have any kind of remineralization, that is a technology that is being that is evolving. Uh, the dental industry is trying to see how we can actually heal cavities, but that is long time coming. Uh, I don't think we is something that you can. Just go to CVS and buy a remineralizing uh, chemical and apply to your cavity and it beats it back up and it's like, like brand new tooth, like, uh, like bone healing. We don't have that technology yet. But uh, fluoride can reduce uh, you know, um, plaque accumulation and can also reduce uh, incidence of caries, new caries. Uh, but it does not actually change the structure of your tooth uh, or any of your teeth for that matter, if you're an adult. Uh, a child that is still below six, if you incorporated uh, fluoride in their food or in their water or their you know, uh, you know, supplements, they will, they will have benefits in their teeth. Their adult teeth will benefit from it. Thank you so much. I, 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 wanted, I wanted to ask about the children, be specific, because, you know, we prescribe it to children. Doctor, well, I'm surprised about your, I'm, I'm surprised your dentist said that. I've, <laughs> I don't know. I've never heard well, well, you know, what we call standard operating procedure sometimes allows us to do things because this is standardized procedure. You tell everybody that comes for a checkup, uh, how are you doing with your teeth? How are you doing with that? Are you flossing? Are you brushing? You know, you tell us, yes, you're doing all of that. And some people will ask, you know, most of the time is the, the patient that will ask the dentist. So which is the best toothpaste? Mm -hmm. oh, look at, I mean, I'll look at them funny like, what? 
you know, there's really no best toothpaste. If you know what you are trying to clean, all you're trying to do is clean uh, your, you know, your the plaque off of your teeth. You can even use, uh, you know, your washcloth if you know how to use it properly. You can use an ordinary toothbrush to clean your teeth without even having to use anything. Uh, but what we are doing is we're using mechanical agitation to remove what is adherent to the tooth surface, right? So whether we do or we do what we're trying to do is get rid of that thin layer of plaque on our teeth. And when we don't do a good job, it becomes hardened. And when it becomes hard, it becomes tattered. Then that way your toothbrush cannot clean it. You have to now scrape it off. And if you try to do it at home, you get bleeding gums. You cut your gums in every direction. <laughs> so you have to come to the dental office to get help. And so when you come to us, then we clean it for you. We'll be clean. But when you get home again, if you still go do whatever you normally do, you come back in six months, the tatter builder will be up again. So, so it's kind of like, when we motivate patients, we motivate them to try to keep a very healthy lifestyle and also to maintain uh, a good uh, home care, which is if you brush twice a day, you have not done anything wrong. If you brush once a day, you brush properly, you have not done anything wrong because even when we told you to brush two times, many people would choose to brush only once. So it's not a big deal. We tell you anyways, uh, so your dentist did what he normally would do to everybody. So he won't miss anybody. So if you want to spend your money, you can buy a toothpaste with fluoride. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Jagwe. Yes. There are, there are a few things here. Okay. It just occurred to me, you know, for me, mm -hmm. because that call gate, you know, from Nigeria, it was called gate we were using. And I get in my head fast because Colgate has been something else. I remembered when you talked to us about Sensodyne. That was years ago. I tried the Sensodyne thing for like a day or two. I'm like, ah, I'm not feeling it. You know, Colgate gives you this uh, spank. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost peppery. And um, I guess it's because I'm, I'm used to it. Okay. But I'm just thinking about that now, that what Dr. Booker said. We have all this toothpaste that has fluoride in them. And, you know, they have baking soda, uh, peroxide, and fluoride. And some of us go, you know, that's, those are the kinds of toothpaste we buy. You've also told us that um, we shouldn't be brushing too hard, like you just said now, that you can just use cloth. You've told us that, that we can just use cloth to wipe and it's okay. And, you know, you, some of us, me, guilty, change from hard toothbrush that I used to use to the, uh, to the, it's medium. medium. No, medium. no, no, I don't use medium. I soft. actually use the soft, you know, I use the soft, but I still end up putting force because you have to feel it. And sometimes it hits the gum and it hurts. How do you prevent that? I mean, this thing is in the brain and it's not, I'm trying. Okay. All right, so two things. Uh, you were talking about toothpaste from Nigeria. Um, I can tell you the brands of toothpaste commonest in Nigeria. Only a few people really have access to Colgate. The, because the market share in Nigeria is for Pepsodent. Pepsodent is big in Nigeria. Um, uh, there is this uh, close-up is big in Nigeria. So they have big market share in Nigeria or West Africa to, you know, to say the least. Uh, Colgate is struggling in Africa, but you know, they still have their market share. But Colgate in America and in Europe, <laughs> they have the gigantic market share. So anyways, um, if you are used to any particular toothpaste, it's okay. I mean, I'm not telling you toothpaste is bad, bad, bad. But if you read the label, I told you to do that before. Look at the package and see the warning 
on that package and decide if it's just like somebody telling you you need to smoke and it is to give you the Surgeon General's warning on the packet, well, you are opening your eyes, poisoning yourself. So for as far as I'm concerned, if the Colgate, man, I mean, if the toothpaste manufacturer, I don't really talk about any brand in particular, but if you look at the, all of their packets have the warnings. And I think um, the ones that are being made by Procter and Gamble have been skipping the warning. They might be doing it intentional because see, if there is no oversight, nobody is really enforcing that. Well, I mean, they can get away with it. They're still selling, selling them in billions of dollars. So um, whatever it is, do what is healthy for you. I don't think taking fluoride out of your brushing is going to hurt you if you're an adult. If you're doing the right thing, you're cleaning your teeth. So the second uh, question that you ask is about the force of brushing. Well, I, I will still use the, uh, uh, the analogy of uh, your you know, expensive China plate. Uh, let's say you just ate moi moi. Dr. Booker, you know what moi moi is, right? Of course, Dr. Booker went to medical school in Lagos. Oh, I'm just asking, just to, to just to confirm, you are muted. She's a Yoruba woman with many <laughs> souls. Huh? With many <laughs> souls. <laughs> Let me make it. Okay. Now, She's imagine. She's a Yoruba woman. I know. I'm just kind of just emphasizing that. Uh, it, let's say you just eat moi moi in your expensive dish. All right, and then you want to clean the moment from your expensive dish. What would you use to clean it? Would you use a scorer? You won't use a scorer. I mean, you know the delicate nature of your expensive dish. So you're going to use washcloth, I mean, I mean dish cloth, to clean it gently, to make sure not, no scratches, nothing, whatever. Uh, the same thing with your teeth. Your teeth are more expensive than the China that you're spending all the efforts to keep intact. The only time you know how expensive your tooth, your tooth is, is when you have to replace it with, a, with an artificial one. <laughs> if you're going to replace one single tooth with an implant, it's going to cost you not less than $4,000, depending on where you go. The cheapest may be about $4,000. That is replacing the root, which is implant, and building it up with the crown and everything like that. That would be at least $4,000. Now, do you have any single dish that costs $4,000 at in your house? I don't think so. So if you take good care of your dish at home, why are you not taking good care of your teeth in your mouth? Okay. So the force that you're going to use should be commensurate to what, how thick the plaque in your mouth is. If the plaque has been there for one week, just using a gentle stroke of uh, soft toothbrush will not clean nothing. You hear me? It's already becoming very sticky. Sticky to the point that if you just gently brush over it, it will not go. Mm -mm. Now you have to use something a little bit more. Now that, that then brings us to the to my own recommendation that you use the baking soda. Baking soda has the gritty feel. You hear me? You, it has abrasive feel. And the abrasive feel of the uh, baking soda doesn't last but a few seconds because it dissolves in your saliva. So it cannot keep your tooth being scratched for a prolonged period of time. The one thing that the baking soda will do is it will immediately remove any plaque, immediately. If you use it properly, it will immediately remove any plaque from any surface of your tooth. So if you can do that, all right, if you can do that consistently, you will not need a, a stronger toothbrush. You will not need a medium toothbrush. You will not need 
is, is you know, a hard toothbrush. Uh, there are some that are hard, that almost like a, a steel brush. I mean, I'm telling you, some people, they, can't, they don't feel they have brush unless they use such toothbrushes. But they keep wearing away the surfaces of their teeth. As micron, micro, micrometer, you know, level of, or nanometer even, you know, layers of two structures are being brushed off every time that they brush with such uh, vehement force. So if you feel, I think the easiest way to do it is this. Before you brush, move your tongue around your teeth and feel what it feels like. Brush the way you normally brush. Rinse your mouth. Use your tongue to feel it again. If you don't feel any change, that means you have not done much. So you got to do it again until you feel a definite change that the tooth surface is really smooth. No layer of anything is on top of it, not even the layer of toothpaste. Because your tongue is the most sensitive part of your human body. Your, your tongue can detect the smallest defect in your tooth surface, anywhere in your mouth. So if your tongue can detect a thin layer of plaque or a spot of plaque left somewhere, then you can just focus on using your tongue to identify where you need to pay more attention to. So I hope that helps somebody. Uh, so Dr. Booker, don't worry, not having uh, um, Fluoride is not going to kill your teeth. Uh, uh, no, at this age, what am I looking for fluoride for? <laughs> <laughs> I barely have enough teeth. Mm -hmm. It's all right. I mean, we don't want you to lose any more tooth. Oh, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the hard toothbrush that you said, I laughed because that described me. But I've moved away from there for years now. You know, very so good. I'm not there anymore with those hard toothbrushes. But when you were saying that, I'm like, that was me at one yeah. time. You know, I thought the harder I brush and the harder this toothbrush, the better it was, but it wasn't. So um, I have a comment here in the, in the chat box that chewing stick is the best all time. What do you think? I didn't hear that question properly. Um, it's, it was a comment. Chewing okay. stick. Mm -hmm. Chewing stick is the best all time. What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, you, well, that comment is very interesting. Uh, that I would not say yes, and I would not say no, because I've done research uh, on chewing stick, all the different kinds of chewing stick from different parts of Africa. Uh, and, and so I can say to you, because of the, some medicinal properties in some of these uh, twigs, yes, they do have some kind of inherent, um, you know, uh, medicinal benefits, you know, in cleaning the teeth. Uh, there hasn't been any chewing stick that has been... Uh, identified to contain natural fluoride. Okay, so I can't say that from that standpoint, there's a chewing stick that you can get that has all the, uh, everything that they put in the toothpaste in it so that you can actually defer to using a chewing stick, uh, such chewing stick instead of toothbrush and, and uh, toothpaste. Um, a chewing stick, if you don't know how to chew it properly, it's not gonna serve you well. Uh, and you can see it, um, the telltale mark is what you see in Africa. When, uh, when, uh, when Africans come to places like, the, uh, like Europe or America or Canada, oh, we wanna brag about how good our chewing stick is and uh, how superior our chewing stick is and then uh, from a dental standpoint, we do research, uh, we do clinical research evaluation, epidemiological evaluation of the population, and we're finding how people are losing their teeth. 
in Africa, just like they are losing it in uh, any part of the world. Oh, wow. They don't eat as much sugar. Why not? Why are they losing their teeth? Well, because the use of twin stick, though it may have some medicinal properties, they're not using it properly. Uh, many people do not even know how to chew the twin stick, the end of the stick properly, not to get a, a very effective cleansing property. So, uh, you know, that's why I said I would say, I don't want to say yes or say no, uh, but definitely there are pros and cons to using chewing stick. If you know how to use the chewing stick very well, oh, by all means, oh my gosh, you can do a very thorough job of cleaning your teeth and you don't even need anything else. You don't even need baking soda. You don't need hydrogen peroxide if you can do a good job. You know, I would defer to chewing stick, uh, to toothbrushes and, you know, and uh, pacifier that is being used in America. If a child learns to chew stick, do you know that the child will not technically have any problem with the jaw alignment? If a child... Yes, if a child knows how to chew stick, uh, now we are moving in that direction to correct malocclusion here in America. They, they now have chew sticks, uh, or you know, they are not made from stick sticks, they are made from uh, silicone to encourage children who have severe crowding to begin to grow their, you know, to begin to grow their jaws. So, um, that's why I want to say that the chewing stick has its benefits. Uh, that's why you hardly see, I mean, we do see crowding in Africa. We see malocclusion in Africa, but you don't see it as many, uh, as, you know, high uh, in the population as it is in other parts of the world. And that may have something to do with the toughness of what we chew on. Uh, we chew sugar cane, we chew sticks, we chew uh, tough meat. Uh, people love mama. People love, uh, uh, you know, cow food. People love chicken feet, papa. You know, so people like to chew things that are tough. Uh, and that seems to be helping in the area of growing the jaw. Um, so uh, rather than having crowding, most Africans develop spacing because their jaws are growing you know, larger than the size of their teeth. So we have uh, the other uh, end of the spectrum taking place in Africa. So, so Dr. Jagwe, so will that chewing stick also help adults? I know you said it helps. Yes. Adults. It helps yes. adults. So it can help you... everybody. Chewing okay. stick, you know. Okay, no, I mean why... the jaw, because you've talked a lot about the jaw. Um, well, they, yes. Um, if your if your food has been like mush, or you don't have, let's say you have crowding, and you don't, you know, you still have been eating all those things, tough food, and all of that, and the crowding is not resolving. Well, it it only shows that you, your jaw is 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 kind of needs a little bit of approach. Uh, if you're doing the chewing stick from the get-go, you will not necessarily have crowding of your teeth. That is supported by research, okay? So I'm not saying chewing stick by itself. I'm saying chewing anything that is hard. That is moving, from, uh, moving a child, a baby from uh, breast milk to adult food, not going to mush. You understand what I'm saying? Not going to GABA, baby food, and all the uh, uh, Similac or whatever it is uh, the, that you mix that becomes like uh, oats, you know, soft, mushy stuff. If you begin to give a child something to chew once they begin to have their uh, baby teeth, it will stimulate the jaws to grow and the tongue also to develop because the child will begin to learn how to swallow properly. But when you use baby pacifier for extended period of time, the child does not know how to swallow properly. That's why many of the babies that are on, uh, on um, 
uh, pacifier for extended period of time always have lung problems. They aspirate a lot. Uh, they develop asthma. They develop all kinds of respiratory problems. So um, I will replace, you know, I will replace a pacifier with chicken, <laughs> chicken bone, you know, any day, any time, you know, for a child that wants to nibble on something, uh, you know, and that encourages them to begin to learn to swallow properly, as well as control the, you know, the way they actually use their jaw. They may not even have teeth, but they use their gums to nibble on these things and it's very healthy for the jaw development. Great, thank you, sir. So a question here, um, is it advisable to use electric toothbrush? Some dentists recommend it. Well, um, I, okay. I'll go back to the same analogy. What do you want to clean? If you're cleaning something as thin as moi moi smear on your teeth, I don't think I need electric toothbrush to clean that. Now, I bet if I if I'm if I am always leaving my teeth for weeks, not brushing properly. And when I move my tongue after one week, I can see a whole lot of buildup between my teeth. Well, my regular soft toothbrush would not remove that. I just said that earlier, right? So if you didn't brush your teeth properly for three days, the plaque accumulation is not gonna come off easily. So you have to use a little bit more force to get it out. So in that case, yes, uh, you can do uh, power, you know, electric power toothbrushes. Um, I don't want to knock any dentist, but most of the time it's for commercial reasons. When I carried the electric toothbrush in my practice for patients, it was a it was a good money maker. Uh, the same thing with with water floss. Uh, you know, people use, you know, the the manufacturers will come to you and say, okay, we'll give it to you at a very reasonable rate of pricing uh, where you can make as much profit as you want. And it's not regulated by any, <laughs> any government. Uh, if I sold you electric toothbrush, uh, electric toothbrush during Christmas for $300, you will buy it joyfully because you want to treat yourself. Then maybe I bought it for 25 bucks and it doesn't matter. But you like the brand, you're getting what you pay for. <laughs> But um, I just know that I educate my own patients to know they make, you know, informed decision. They need to make informed decision. They need to know why they are buying, why they, what they are buying. Uh, if they still want to buy it, if I told them that they can still use uh, the cheap, less than $1 toothbrush to clean their teeth effectively, well, that's on them. They just want to, you know, treat themselves to something sophisticated. There's nothing wrong with them. But if you buy the toothbrush and you still still develop cavity, you still have gum disease, then I think you just throw your money away. Thank you. So, um, Tutumekete, I'm going to put this together. Is from Ethiopia, and says that. They use um, baking soda a lot, that they use it to brush, not chew it. And she was asking about water flossing. I'm not familiar with that. Well, we have uh, water floss, um, or we just call it water peak, actually. Uh, water peak, it's a reservoir um, that has a tube connected to the reservoir and it can be powered and it has a pump. The pump now shoots a stream of water through a very fine hole uh, at the tip of the tube. And it, it shoots with kind of like a force and it can go between teeth. It only makes sense if you have spaces between your teeth. If you don't have gaps between your teeth, it's not going to work a whole lot. 
If your gum is already receded, yes, it will work because you already have a thorough passage between from the front to the back of your teeth. That may work. If you have a bridge, yes, it will work because you are shooting the water like a power hose, uh, you know, to clean under the bridge that you have. So water flossing is, is available for those who know how to use it. Uh, people buy it and they just let, leave it after one week or two weeks, just like any other gadgets that people spend money to buy. Uh, once the hype is all over, it collects dust. Uh, but if you use it properly, it can be very useful for those who have spaces. If your teeth are very tight, there is no space between your teeth and you want to use water pick, it's almost like you're using water hose to try to go in between a, 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 a brick, uh, between bricks in, in a house. The force can actually destroy the brick, you know, the mortar that's holding the brick together if the force is powerful enough. The same thing you would do if you try to force the water in between very tight uh, junction between the teeth. So you will be tearing away the gum tissue and you are counter, that's counterproductive. You are doing the exact opposite of what you don't want to do. So it may be dangerous to use water pick if you don't need it. Uh, but if you need it and you use it properly, it is very effective. Thank you. Um, Dr. Augustine, Mwabweze said, thanks for the knowledge you are sharing, Dr. Ajebe. Quick question. Some of us use charcoal and salt in brushing our teeth growing up. Is there any benefit from the use of that? Well, um, believe it or not, it's trending again. <laughs> um, uh, is trending again coming from China. The Chinese, they've, they studied what is going on, uh, what's been going on in Africa, you know, in the past, and they come up with commodities that Africans will buy. So now they are making charcoal impregnated toothbrushes, they are making charcoal impregnated uh, toothpaste, they are making charcoal powder, uh, they are making, you know, they're making charcoal in whichever way to clean your teeth. So, yes, any dentifrice, uh, we we'll call it dentifrice because they can clean tooth surfaces. Remember, the, the question you want to answer to yourself is, what am I cleaning? What do I want to clean? If I want to clean a pot that was used on firewood that has soot, very black, all over the alumin aluminum uh, pots that used to be shiny. Well, I need abrasive to clean all of that. Although the Chinese are already coming up with chemicals that you just put in water and you put your pot and it comes out like it's brand new. <laughs> so we have all kinds of things that's available now. Uh, we talked about things that can actually get rid of uh, porphyrimonas, uh, gingivalis, uh, we talk about the bio um, um, probiotics that you can use in the mouth to kill those bacteria or at least act as competitors against the very dangerous porphyrimonas gingivalis in the mouth. Charcoal also does similar thing. Uh, uh, charcoal is an adsorbing agent. Okay, so <laughs> that's a big word. We activated charcoal, for instance, is used in case of poisoning. So when somebody, you know, ingested poison for, you know, food poisoning or whatever, and they have activated charcoal, they can give to that individual and it would absorb the, uh, the poison from the stomach. And then of course it can be passed down. So similarly in the mouth, if you use charcoal for somebody who has, uh, you know, very, let's say dry mouth and they increase, they have uh, plaque accumulation that is uh, higher in, in rate than other people. Yes, charcoal will be of very great help to them. 
Uh, but if you're doing your normal cleaning, uh, like we'll be talking, adding to a uh, charcoal to your brushing is not going to make it worse. It's not going to make it better. It's just that if you use it, that will be your preference. You may want to mix it with uh, baking soda. That's not going to do anything that deleterious or adverse to you. So the only thing is don't swallow it. Don't keep chewing on it. <laughs> and so uh, don't swallow the spit. Uh, spit everything and rinse thoroughly. Thank you. So Dr. Buka wants to know what fluoride supplements do you recommend for children? Honestly, I think they have fortified almost every baby product uh, with fluoride. So I would not recommend uh, special, uh, specific, you know, additional uh, fluoride to a child because that has its own uh, negative effect on the formed teeth. Uh, we don't want the child to, you know, swing from not having fluoride at all to having fluorosis. Fluorosis is a condition where you have excessive uh, deposition of or integration of uh, fluoride into the formed teeth. Such teeth will have what we call all these white patches, or sometimes it may have brownish color. Um, I'm sure if you've interacted with people from East Africa, particularly from uh, Kenya, uh, Zambia, uh, and from uh, Malawi, you may see people that have brown teeth. It's their natural teeth. Uh, they don't have decay because they have very high fluoride content in their water. So if, you, if the baby is already getting fluoride from every other source, there will be no need to add any fluoride as an uh, as a supplement. So the baby needs the fluoride while the permanent teeth are forming, primarily. So that's when you need the uh, the fluoride. So please, before you look elsewhere, unless you the baby doesn't use a formula, doesn't use anything that has uh, fluoride in it, then maybe you could look for multivitamin drops that already that has uh, you know, fluoride as part of the content. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Damien is back. Welcome back all the way from London. We miss you. Been emailing you. No response. Damien says... He commented that electric toothbrush is useful in handicapped persons. And he then asked, what is the recommended age in children for orthodontic treatment? Orthodontic, that's uh, the braces. That's braces, uh, using braces. Well, um, the earliest that you could do anything interventive will be three years old, that's the earliest. But you cannot use the adult kind of braces because the teeth are so tiny, they have any teeth. If they have teeth in their mouth, the, the crowns are so tiny that you cannot do the conventional braces. So we use things like arch expanders, which will be cemented to the back teeth. So um, intervention, can be, be, can be started uh, by expanding the jaws when they already have crowded baby teeth. Uh, usually the earliest will be three years old. Thank you, sir. Um, Achia Pong said, putting charcoal in a soup about to spoil can stop it from spoiling. That's interesting, I didn't know that. Well, yes, uh, it's, a, it's, it's interesting because it it's used to be a practice in Africa yeah. for, 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 for centuries. Uh, if, you just made, if you wanted to make moi moi or akara and you're not ready to mix them 
and you've gone to the uh, to the public place to grind the uh, the the beans, you brought it home and you don't want it to get sour. You will put a big charcoal, clean charcoal, right in the center of the uh, of the beans of the big basin of beans, and the beans will not go sour. Yeah. Now, yes, uh, I've I've done it before, and I've seen it done several times among the Yorubas. I've seen it. I don't know whether other uh, groups of people do it. Yes, charcoal does it. So then it's good for most things then that we've talked about. Yes. The charcoal is very incredible. I mean, unbelievable. It's like a gift to mankind. Once mankind discovered it, it's like they come up with all kinds of use for it. Yes, it's, it's good. So adding baking soda to charcoal, like you said, mm-hmm. the win mm-hmm. And then you know, is it, is it win, is a win win situation? That peroxide, you know, I wonder where we can get charcoal here, though. Well, in the US, you burn, you burn your you can burn any wood to get charcoal. I'm not talking about the charcoal that's pre- processed in the factory, no wood oh. charcoal. So you have, you, have to, you have to burn your own wood. Sorry, you were saying something, Miss uh, Achepong. From your fireplace. It's called edu, and we use it like he said in bean. You know, even um, pepper on soup. Yeah. Edu. Yes. Okay. If you if you have very good, if you know, there's the not fireplace. Every, okay. It's not every firewood that you use in your fireplace that could be <laughs> you have to know which one has some resins that are dangerous. So uh, some some plants have resins in them that the fumes can actually be dangerous. Okay, so um, it would be advisable if you want to do something like that to find woods that are, you know, that will not cause more trouble. <laughs> so most of the woods that we use in Africa, you know, don't have such raisins. So I, you know, I would say that if you're going around, uh, maybe you shouldn't use any any wood that is from pine, uh, pine wood. Uh, maybe you shouldn't use anything that is uh, from juniper. But maybe if you have anything from oak, that should be fine. Okay, what about the wood we use in Nigeria? To, to... That's what I'm saying, those ones, they because I don't know. It. Okay, good. So okay. that's what I'm saying. That in Africa we don't seem to have woods with the dangerous uh, raisins. So Sister Umi said that she has seen it used in blended beans too. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you know, when it's blended, you know, the beans you put it in the middle of it. You, so yes. It Let people beans. not think they have they have to blend it with the beans. So no. You use a chunk of charcoal. <laughs> what, what, you uh, see, Sister Chiapong, you see what you started. So what, I what she, question, though. So Go what she's talking about. question. Sorry, Dr. Yogi. Sorry, I okay, think what you are saying finish. is, what you are saying about the soup or the sauce is you just drop a clean lump of charcoal in it. That's mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. Not that you blend it with uh, mm-hmm. the stew. Or with uh, with the pepper, no. Mm-mm. No, yeah. I was just agreeing with what you said, um, Doctor Jagwe, that I've seen it used where they put it in the blend in, after the blend after the beans has been blended, just to mm-hmm. preserve it. I'm just yep. agreeing with what you said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Sister Chepong, go ahead. So, so, anything that is spoiling, right? You can put the charcoal in. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It will, it will bring it back. But my question well, it, it will prevent it from getting yeah. worse. Yes, mm-hmm. it will prevent it from getting worse. Thank you. So my question is, I used to see, what do you say about people who use, you know, the chewing, chewing sponge? We have the chewing stick and then we have chewing sponge, right? So mm-hmm. we chew the sponge 
and then mm -hmm. they dip it in charcoal or they dip it in the ashes, you know, after you the coal pot, mm -hmm. you know, the ashes, and they mm -hmm. use that to clean their teeth and it becomes so white. What do yeah. you say about well, that? Yes. Um, thank you for saying that. It's similar to um, you just taking, uh, you know, a palm full of ashes and just putting some water and just making a paste and using your finger to clean your teeth. You don't even have to use a sponge. Uh, when we are growing up, we use ashes, we use charcoal, we use combination of ashes, charcoal, and uh, <laughs> ceramic powder. You know, when, you, when your dish breaks, mm -hmm. uh, they will grind it into powder and they will mix it as part of a, a yes, mixture so for cheese. Yes, they add soap. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could do that. Um, this chew sponge is not common in some parts of West Africa. I think it's common in, uh, in Ghana. Yeah. But don't see chew sponge in, in Nigeria. Mm. Uh, because chewing stick seems to be everywhere. I mean, anywhere you go, if you don't even have to buy it from the market. You have an hibiscus uh, bush in your, in your compound, that's your chewing stick. You just go there and pluck a twig and you chew on it, and when you need more, you go back. If you don't want to do hibiscus, you go to bitter leaf you know, plant, you pluck a little branch, you chew on it, you are fine. And even mango tree, mango, mm. mango tree, you pluck a, a twig, you chew on it, you are fine. Any, any plant you see in, in Africa that you can pluck a twig from is your twin stick. You can chew it and clean your teeth as beautifully as you can, as you like to. Yes, ashes like charcoal have been used for centuries in Africa as cleaning, as a dentifrice for cleaning teeth. Uh, some people will use cotton wool, okay? You get cotton wool and you dip it in, uh, you soak it in water and you use it to pick um, a little bit of ashes from firewood or from a cold pot, uh, you know. Another thing that the ashes are used for uh, is in making soap, traditional soap. The black soap is made from the potash, from the um, from the uh, wood that we call ashes. Okay, thank you. I just want to ask something. So right now, mm. we do see a lot of sugar cane in America. Yes. When you chew it, you don't mm. throw the leaf out. That is your sponge that you can use to brush your teeth, just to let you guys know. It's a sponge. Really? Yes. You know, I was, I was going to ask you, to please do me a favor that what? I want to know what this sponge looks like. I've never even ever. Oh, I used to have. Okay. So it's the, like the, the, the sugar cane. That's no. black. No. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Jagbe. <laughs> well, I mean, the chew sponge, you know, the, there is a sponge. Um, there is a plant that grows a fruit that actually when it dries up, the core of it is like a sponge, it's porous. So you can use that, you know, you can, you can chew on that. It's not like the same thing as a stick. I don't know whether it's the same thing. No, that, we, uh, we, we, we all know the stick. Wait, okay. The sponge, so, the sponge, so I the, don't know. The sponge is what I am curious about. And I don't know yes. if there are other people on the platform who has never even heard of it, like me. Yeah, um, okay. That's that oh. Um, yes. Okay. I'm a Lagosian. I'm a Lagosian. We don't have, we didn't that's have a lot of IJ and Pastor Anna can give you some of the chewing the chewing sponge. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. I All right. Appreciate that. So yeah, you are the, saying the something sugar cane. the sugar cane is yes. also good for black sugar. I, I mentioned that when I started talking. That one of the things that we, you know, we can leverage in keeping our oral hygiene is chewing sugar cane. Uh, because of the fibrous uh, nature of sugar cane, 
once you chew on it and you suck the sweetness off uh, away from the fiber, the fiber becomes a mechanical tool to clean your teeth. So even if you don't do it intentionally, as you chew the sugar, I mean, the sugar cane is actually brushing your teeth for you. So you have to bear that in mind. So sugar cane is, is good, it's natural. Uh, the, the sugar from the sugar cane uh, is not the same as uh, the fruit, the uh, high, uh, you know, fructose corn syrup. Uh, is healthier than the corn syrup or the uh, high fructose syrup from any other source, for that matter. Thank you. So there's a question here: Can we buy the pill form of charcoal? Can we buy what? The pill form of charcoal. The peel form of charcoal. And wow. oh my gosh, these are what? The natural are, toothbrushes. Okay, no, this, I, this, I know this. This, this, this are, are the, the chewing, these are the chewing sticks. Yes, that's toothbrushes in Ghana. That is clear. And um, yes, Dr. Ajay, I know this one is the sponge. I've never heard of it. I'm sure there are other people on this platform that have not heard of that. Uh, uh, chewing sponge. Mm -hmm. Well, like, uh, like me, we were we were called gates. Called gates. Chewing, chewing, yeah, gates. chewing sponge. Okay, chewing sponge. one second, please, sir. I was going to say, call gate was what we knew that I knew growing up. I didn't even know about. I saw all of those ones, pepsodines and stuff, but in my household it was called gate. So Lagosians, we didn't we we know the the um the chewing sticks, but it's the sponge that I think most of us will not know. If I don't know it, I'm sure some other people don't. So can we buy the pill form of I charcoal? I said you that. That's the O. Yes, I'm gonna get it. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Okay. <clears throat> now I think there is, I mean, there's anything that you look for online that you, almost anything you will find, uh, you know, in online. I believe that you could get some pill, I mean, some capsules, not in pill form, but in capsular form. Uh, some people will say they're using it for detoxification, uh, but you know, it's only, I mean, my professional exposure to it was in uh, poison, you know, from forensic standpoint, you know, so those are some of the things you look for uh, in case there was poisoning. And then somebody has been given some antidotes uh, that didn't work. And you look for traces of uh, activated charcoal in their stomach content. Yeah, then yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure you could find the capsules for charcoal now. Activated charcoal is what you need, not the egg, not the ordinary charcoal that you find from the fireplace. Yeah, that, we use activated charcoal in medicine. Yes, that's yeah. the one that can be ingested. Yeah, it's used as an adsorptive agent. Yeah, in to, yeah, not something to be digested and go into your body system, no, it cannot be absorbed. Um, so um, Dr. Alu asked if uh, chewing gum is healthy. Well, chewing gum is, hmm, it's better to chew something for somebody who has crowding than not to chew anything. Uh, chewing has been found to be connected to, uh, uh, you know, healthy jaw development. However, if you chew gum all day or all night, well, you're swallowing a lot of air. So that is something that you, okay, see, this is a chew, chew sponge. 
um, that they're showing now. Can you see that? <laughs> so yes. this is this yes, is this is. is. I've never seen it before, though. All right, this is the kind that we use for coin coin in in Nigeria. You know the one they are with us. This is the same. This is the same vine they use for making coin coin. I thought coin coin is white, whiter than this. This is no, no, no. This this will be beat into pulp. It will fine thing. They will pull it out and form it into this. If you've seen the Aousas beating this with, you know, um, with some wood, some hard wood against a stone to make to break the fibers. So now they tease out the fiber to make the the sponge that we use to wash our bodies in in Nigeria. It's the same uh, 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 material they use. Mm -hmm. But this one, if you're using it for brushing your teeth, you only get a short segment of it. You cannot put that whole thing in your mouth to do it. You just chew because it's like a pre-chewed stick for you. You understand? It's like a pre-chewed stick for you. If you cut a short segment of it, you just chew a little bit and then you have enough to clean your teeth. So you take your finger to move it around the teeth? No, you use it, you use it just like you use your chew stick in Nigeria. Okay, you use I see. it the same way. Okay. That is interesting. I would love to try that. So mm -hmm. um there are other suggestions of trees, olive tree, pigeon pea twig, um, grinded sea seafood shells are also elves like the ashes, grinded sea seafood shells. Well, that, well, that's true. Like ashes. Well, it's true. That's exactly, it's similar to what I just said about the uh, ceramic dishes, broken ceramic dishes. Uh, when, it, you know, in, in, at least in my part of uh, Nigeria, if you, if you broke um, a ceramic dish, they will take the pieces they would, they would uh, grind it down into powder and it could be used for uh, scoring pots. It could be used for brushing teeth. So I know that for a fact, yes, you could use uh, seafood shells as well. If it's hard enough, you can grind it into powder and eventually use it. Um, then you could also use um, uh, there's something else that you could use. Actually, some people use uh, sea sand. I mean, the sand, the fine sand that you get from the seashore, they use it as part of their dentifrice. They mix it with salt, they mix it with charcoal, and they use it to clean their teeth using cotton wool. That's so cool. Charles just shows, uh, posted a picture in the chat box too of this sponge. This sponge looks like the one we use in Nigeria. It's similar to the one that uh, Dr. Ajay posted here on the right hand side. That one I know, I've seen. So this one is for one. bathing. You, you bathe with this one. It's exactly. Different. Yeah, this is for bathing. Okay. It's the, sa is the same uh, vine they use for this, it's a climber. The, 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 but the, this one is for bathing, right? The ones that yes, that's what I described to you a little earlier. That okay, look at one in the chat box, yeah, that Charles the, posted. That one is similar to the one that was posted before. I think that's the chewing sponge, yes. The chewing sponge is like two steps before the bathing sponge. The one you use to have your bath is much later after they keep on beating that vine. Thank you so much. This is so educational. And there's a video that he posted. He's an IT guru, by the way. Let me tell on him. You know, when you talk about those AIs that go over my head, that's, <laughs> he knows all of that. He, could, he can share his screen so everybody gets to see the video. Yeah, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, that's true. If he shares his screen, can share your screen, see, Charles. We all see please. what is going. Give me a co-host. Okay, hold on a second. You can, you can share it. Let me see. Where are you? I'm looking for you. Okay, I see you. Let me give you a co-host. 
Yeah, sorry, can you hear me? You go. Yeah, you can share oh, it okay. now. Okay, yeah, one second. Um, I just closed the screen, but I'll share it now, one second. So cool. So it also says there's a video shows how it's being used in Ghana. That's what he wants to show. Oh. Okay. All right, yeah, here we go. You should be able to see my screen. Just how we live and do things generally. While advancements make things simpler, there are other habits in or in Kolegono. Residents are already up, bracing up for the day, both young and old. 80-year-old Charlotte Dede Aye is yet to have breakfast. But before that, she must chew sponge for several minutes. <laughs> The sponge removes flames and unwanted particles from the mouth. It keeps it clean. I am unable to eat if I have not used the sponge. Regina Ankara, alias Liberty, and other residents who remain attached to the tradition handed them are undertaking their morning ritual. We use it a piece at a time. It takes away bad odor and freshens the mouth. I recall growing up in a neighborhood at Labadi. In the neighborhood, it is all you see in the morning. Neighbors standing in queues before a shower, rigorously chewing the sponge. It has not changed. Evelyn Commodore explained Things the younger generation also do same. We have taught our children to use it, so it is the first thing they do when they wake up. In spite of the availability of toothpaste and brushes, do sponges still have a place? Dr. Jennifer Tete is a dental surgeon at the Elmina Polyclinic. Once it's coming from plants, then you should expect that, yes, it has some medicinal properties. And so we are lo looking at some antibacterial properties. Um, we're looking at some antifungal properties. And then we're also looking at, at some antiviral properties as well. The medicinal properties that comes with the, 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 the plant usage is something that makes it a little bit more superior, if I may say, to the toothbrush, which is more of a mechanical tool. But Dr. Tete wants people. Yeah, I think I could stop it there, right? Oh, do you want yeah. me to keep going? That, that's, yes. that's fine. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was beautiful. That was what I wanted to know, to know mm -hmm. how to use it. What I what I thought in my head is actually the way it was used because they actually um, add a little bit in their hands and moved it around the, the mouth. So the sponge though had nothing in it except, you know, just the sponge. So one can add charcoal, put uh, baking soda. So yeah, that, that. that's... I think that's what she asked earlier, that could they use this chew sponge with ashes and charcoal? Yes, you could. Um, but two things, you can see that from that video that we just saw. Did you see any, any of the people chewing on that thing with crowded teeth? None. None. And Dr. Jabe, thank you. spaces between their teeth. That's yes. why I was telling you if, you, if you want to do an epidemiological study now in Ghana to see crowding, to, to observe, you know, malocclusion or crowding of teeth, you may be surprised that the incidence will be so low. You have more spacing, you have more Ghanaians with gaps between their teeth, front teeth, than uh, almost anywhere else. You see that also among the Igbos and the Yorubas because uh, we are constantly chewing, chewing hard stuff.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles, for showing that. I wanted to say that, Dr. Jagwida, you said it earlier. So we're paying $7,000, thousands of dollars um, to widen the, the jaw. So why don't we all get the sponge and just start chewing so that we can, you know, um, expand our- well, you, you could. Um, that's if you, if you started early enough. Uh, but it's not- It's too late I, now? Hmm? It's too late? Well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't done any study on that to see, to use the chew sponge or chew stick as an interventive tool. Uh, if you want to do, it's a, is it is a worthwhile study that needs to be done. We can but, do it. I think we should well, do it. I want, it, I want to be on. one of those. Hold on. Isn't it? Now, the question will be the IRB, Institutional, Institutional Review Board. Are you, when it's asked you, how would you decide who should get standard braces, which is what everybody will be shooting for, and those who would choose sponge. <laughs> so the criteria to use, I mean, I'm just talking about the technicalities of doing that study. Well, it's it's something that needs to be you have to randomize it. You shouldn't use any criteria. You have your population and you just randomize. Well, the you issue is you still have, you, anyway, don't worry about that. I'm okay, just so, trying so to say that. So let's go to that. Let me, Sister, mm -hmm. Sister Kamsen. It's doable. Mm -hmm. Kindly unmute. That was going to be my question, that if you have crowded it now, can you can you start showing to, to create the space? And that's uh, what we're saying. We can, yeah, unless yeah, what was, happens. Okay. But but I, there isn't any study yet. So why yes, can't I, just I can I can back it up with you know just by saying speculatively that it is that it's conceivable because the the study that we know of is now that we are encouraging children here in the U.S. in Canada and Europe to begin to chew on hard stuff as part of the treatment to grow their jaws. So that's that's what I'm just saying that, uh, but if you want to legislate it or bring it as something mandatory in Africa so as to reduce that, it may be a little tough call. No, that is nobody, Dr. Jagwe, but we're not saying that. Nobody's mm -hmm. saying we should mandate it in Africa or anywhere. We're just saying that in adults. Yeah, in, conceivably, yes. It's and we, we, it's, it's worthwhile to try it and see what happens. There's no yep. study, but until we do it, then we don't know. That's why yep. that's how we find things. Yeah. Also, there is a fine line. Uh, excuse me. There's also a fine line. If you look at the video, chewing a little and chewing a lot. So what you see is if a little is good, Africans will do a lot to be best. What they are doing also is wearing down their teeth very radically and very rapidly. So if you look at their teeth, it's like somebody has filed their teeth down. Go back to the video, and then you see that almost all of their teeth is like somebody used a file to grind down their teeth. Why? Because they are overdoing it. They can do it, you know I mean? You do it for a few minutes a day. You still get this, the same effect of cleaning your teeth very well, cleaning your tongue very well. Then when you overdo it, you can get this, the other side of it, which would mean wearing down the teeth. The teeth will become shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it gets to the gum line. And I've seen a lot of Africans like that. I've seen a lot of Nigerians with such teeth here in the US. Thank you. Charles, kindly unmute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I, I, maybe you covered it before I was on the call, but um, I just, I'm curious, is it that when you said about crowded teeth, is that a bad thing? Because I see, you know, my kids, um, they want braces to kind of, you know, pull their teeth together and get this straightened effect. So is it is it better to have spaces in your teeth or is it better to have like the 
the the crowded teeth like with braces okay all of us need our teeth i mean let's put it this way we need enough space in our jaws to accommodate 32 teeth 32 adult teeth that is the uh that is the uh, genetic makeup for human beings. However, environmentally, we have been, we have become, you know, uh, we are de- now we have become devolved to not have enough space. Oh. Uh, archaeology has shown that those of our forefathers in the past who were constantly, um, you know, they, they, they go to hunt, they do, they, you know, they eat uh, fibrous stuff, they eat very tough stuff in the past. That most of the archeological digs never show teeth, I mean, jaws with crowding. Many of these, uh, you know, uh, archaeologically dug out uh, skull, uh, skulls actually show the teeth wearing the same pattern that the people chewing the sponge, the way their teeth are wearing them. Uh, they do not have crowding. They have enough space for all the teeth. Now, we, here in the U.S., the study has shown that the, you know, people that, move from uh, a bottle feeding to GABA type baby food to now eating cheeseburger and eating uh, McNuggets and stuff like that, that they are not chewing enough for their jaws to be stimulated to grow to full potential. Does that make sense? So if your children are not chewing and now they have a lot of crowding of their teeth, then it's imperative that something be done because if they don't do anything with, you know, with the crowding, eventually those overlapping teeth will begin to lose bones. And when they lose bones, they will become lost prematurely. Uh, And most of the time it's the anterior teeth that will experience that crowding most of the time. The front teeth. The front teeth, that's what I mean by anterior teeth. Now, you could have crowding in the back. And when you have crowding in the back, it means the teeth in the back are leaning towards the tongue. If they are leaning towards the tongue, it means the tongue is crowded. Now, the tongue cannot rise up to where it's supposed to be. That's creating more problems. And the primary problem that that will create is airway. Now, let's say the teeth are like this in the back. The tongue is supposed to rise above, the, above the, those back teeth. But because the teeth are like this, they trap the tongue. So the mm-hmm. tongue has nowhere else to go but to go to the back of the throat, more so when the child or the individual is sleeping. So if, it, if any of your children or all of them are experiencing such crowding, it is not just for cosmetic that you need to straighten their teeth. Right. Just using braces is not going to help because the root cause is not addressed. The braces may straighten, the, may make the teeth line up, but it's by tipping the teeth. It's not by growing the jaws. So technology now is available or has, you know, has been refined that can actually cause the jaw bone to grow so that there'll be enough space for all the teeth. So I don't know what your children's jaw look like and as we say on Medical Mondays, we're not establishing doctor-patient uh, relationship just by discussing. Uh, so it's something that somebody needs to look at. Uh, their dentist can refer them to orthodontist if he or she doesn't know, um, you know, doesn't d- deal with uh, braces. But I can, you need to understand that there are newer advances now that can grow the jaw to full potential that you don't even need to extract any tooth. Because most of the time when you, you know, your children or other children like, like them go to the orthodontist and they do the survey and they find that there is no space. 
the first thing they will do is to recommend some extractions. They will extract, they will rec recommend extraction of four T's, four premolar T's that we talked about. And then when the wisdom teeth are coming out, they don't come out straight. So they have to request that those wisdom teeth be removed as well. So now look at that. 32 teeth has become 24 teeth. Wow. Because eight teeth will have been removed. And that does not guarantee that there will still not be crowding. So the best thing is to know the, the underlying cause of this problem and deal with the underlying cause. And then the teeth will automatically find space. Uh, there'll be enough space for all the teeth to line up and the tongue will grow to full potential and all, every space you need in the mouth will be there. There'll be no sleep disorder. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, sir. If I, if I understand what Charles said though in the beginning, he said they want braces to move their teeth together. <laughs> yes, so, because-, because just, just, just one second. I wanted to affirm, do you, do they have gaps in their teeth or is it that their teeth are overlaying, that is overcrowded? It's gaps in their teeth. They have gaps Money, in their yeah. teeth. Mm -hmm. So it's not overcrowded. So, because I was going to say, if it's overcrowded, they laying on one another, uh, then um, maybe eating, you know, brushing with the sponge or, you know, the chewing stick would have helped. But when it's, um, when there's gap in it already, it means that their jaw, from what we have learned from Dr. Ajagbe, is actually, uh, is, as, is actually developing well. Their teeth is fine, it's not overcrowded. From what I have learned from Dr. Ajagbe, I don't know, I'm not the expert, but that, because his question was, they have gaps in their teeth and they, yeah. should they get braces to pull it together? Yeah. 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 Actually touched on 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 actually the, what he what he answered was was what's happening with my other daughter. So she's having some mouth breathing. So that made her a lot of sense. Um, what you were just talking about the the size of the jaw at the back and where the tongue lays when she goes to sleep. So she has difficulty sleeping, um, breathing when she's sleeping. And um, so, so she's we're going for. Yeah, I'm so I'm I'm I'm, I'm taking notes. Um, the sponge is eating the sponge, you know. No, well, we, we spoke to the a, not eating, eating. It's it's just a chewing stick. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> chewing, not eating, okay. chewing the sponge. Eating, no. Chewing, okay. No, no swallow, just um, chew. Okay, no swallow it. <laughs> okay. I, um, I don't know if this is how two of my kids just went through this. Oh. My baby, the boy, he's 12 years old. He, his mm. two of his teeth was inside. We don't see it outside. It just shows on x-ray. And then mm. he had braces. They did whatever. They put something inside on his you know, upper, like whatever, inside. And somehow now two of the teeth has dropped and you can see it out. It did help. So orthodontics help. It was it cost me about 5000 Now he those those teeth are out, they came out and his teeth looks fine. So uh, it, it kind of, the stuff that they put inside, it did help to widen his uh, jaw. Yeah, so I mean. How, how old is your child? Sorry. Dr. He's 12 yeah, years old. 12 years old. Okay, sorry, I missed that. I was waiting, I because my cousin, my my nephew, his teeth got better by 13. I said, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna wait and then see if it gets better by itself, but I didn't even know he has another tooth he's hiding inside. It was crowded. Then the yeah. doctor, she took the x-ray, she said, there is two teeth that are hiding inside. There is no space to come out. And yep. then she said, okay, she will treat him. She put inside his mouth, like the doctor said before. She mm -hmm. did that, that wait for a while and he had the brace for about two years. Now he finished, the two, those two teeth has dropped and his tooth looks fine, so it kind of pushed and widened his uh, jaw. Yeah, okay, that's that's fantastic. So, um, Dr. Ajagbe, the braces, didn't you tell us that if they not, they don't use retainers, things can move back? So, well, it depends. important for the jaw, okay. 
Yes, it depends. It depends on the kind of movement. That's why I was tell what I was saying to you is about the um, the the regular braces. The regular braces does not grow the jaws. Mm -hmm. What it does, it's actually it's um, we call it retrusive type of uh, movement. And retrusive type of movement creates even more problem for the tongue. So our teeth remain in the arch, that is the upper and the lower, in an, in a, in an equilibrium if the force from the tongue equals to the forces of the lips. So if the lip and the tongue are equal and opposite, your teeth will remain in place. Now, imagine the teeth being, you know, being pushed in against the tongue. What is gonna happen? The lip is not gonna have the same tension as the tongue. The tongue wants to push the teeth out. And so eventually, let's say the teeth look straight because of the braces, but there is no space for the tongue. What would the tongue do? The tongue will constantly push on the, on the teeth. And if you don't have a fixed retainer, the teeth are gonna be pushed back to where they felt comfortable. And where they felt comfortable would not be nice, necessarily beautiful to see. So that's where the relapse comes into, into the picture. And so you go to, for orthodontics, you do two years of orthodontic treatment, and they tell you you have to use a retainer and you don't use your retainer, what's going to happen? The teeth will go back to where they felt uh, most comfortable. Well, in this case, it seems like the jaw grew. But Sister Tutu, right? Yeah. Is that what you feel? That the, the Yes, they did. But grew. like the doctor yeah, said, see, it's not what? only the... It's not only the braces, they put their, in their mouths, you were saying it before, yes, inside his mouths. The yeah, they did grow that the jaw. Yes. yes, the expander will grow the jaw. That's what I meant by going to the root cause. The underlying cause is no space and then grow the jaw enough for the space to develop. That's what happened. So, yeah, uh, this is to do. This yes. to do, Mekete. You also said you had three root canals done, and now the fourth one started hurting all next to each other. Correct? Yeah, that, that, that's my question. What happened was I had one root canal that was done, and then the next one after that one is done for a while, and then the next one started done the next one. Now I'm on the fourth. I'm actually refusing to get it done. I'm like, what is going on actually? I'm asking like, is this going to continue? I'm, I'm up to the point I say, you know what, I'm not going to do it and see what happens. So like, I don't know, I'm confused what to do if anybody could tell me anything. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. Dr. Ajagbe. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I'm so sorry to hear that um, the treatment, you know, prescribed to you by your dentist has not resolved your original, your original uh, condition. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it may be that there's something else. Um, one, uh, one factor that people don't pay attention to uh, when they start complaining about toothache is clenching and grinding the teeth. Uh, most dentists will not pick it up unless, you know, there's an ob obvious wear, wear facet on the tooth. Uh, many people have lost teeth just from clenching and they thought they needed a root canal, they needed all this. They would do it, they would get crowns put on top of it and then the crown will break uh, and eventually they will lose the teeth. And it, the main problem is grinding. The main problem is clenching. The two of them go hand in hand. Some may have uh, clenching and no grinding but there is no one who has grinding that doesn't have clenching. Because you have to clench first before you grind your teeth. Uh, your teeth cannot just glide over each other and be, you know, and be like it's filed down. Um, I, if I was, uh, if I have seen you and I know that you've had three 
root canals that are not related to cavities. Now, remember, primary reason for doing root canal, if, they, if your dentist spoke to you about it, uh, is usually when you have cavity in your tooth that has been there for years and has gone and has extended into the root, into the nerve of your tooth. And what root canal does is root canal, we go in and clean it out. We remove the dead or the dying nerve inside your tooth that becomes so painful that you can't even, even ordinary pain pillars, I mean, painkillers will not take care of it. So that's when you go to a root canal. But if you'd never had cavity in your tooth uh, and you go from one tooth to the next one, there is no cavity and you go to the next one, there is no cavity. Well, it may be that you're not even dealing with anything that re re requires a root canal. Maybe that your, your occlusion, your bite needs to be checked and then relieved in such a way that you don't keep clenching on that area and then that will relieve the pain. And then you won't need any root canal. Now, the other thing is that's one possible uh, omission or oversight. The other possible oversight is that, let's say you had four teeth and four teeth have cavities, but they are not the same size of cavities. So you, you had, uh, maybe you had an old feeling in some and you had an old feeling and then you have a new cavity on another tooth, but it may not look like it's a lot. There's something that we call referred pain. Okay, referred pain means um, a different tooth will seem to be the problem. And when you test them, you find that the real problem is not the tooth that you are pointing to. So there may be a situation where you have a referred pain from one tooth to another. Now, as strange as it may sound, you'll be surprised that some people will have problem on the opposing opposing jaw and it will be showing up on the on the on the jaw that is not the one that has a problem so we call that also referred pain because the nerves are connected together the nerves that supply the uh, the teeth they are all connected together so you may have a referred pain from a totally remote tooth that is not even contiguous or close to the one that is that you are pointing to has been the troublesome tooth. So um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I brought this up to the doctor because I personally think my bite is off. Mm -hmm. And I say, listen, my bite is off. And he checked it, he checked it, he said, your bite is not off. I say, I feel like my bite is off. And well. I think I am grinding a knife, which I don't know. I guess I'm grinding. Mm -hmm. And then um, he gave me the, of course, the guard. Night, the night guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the bottom. But what happened is sometimes I find it on the pillow. <laughs> and uh, I do not have any kind of cavity with the teeth that it's especially the one that he's trying to dig in it doesn't have cavity so the, yeah. the pain the pain relieved get relieved by motrin i used to take it almost every six hours now it's every i don't know eight to twelve hours mm -hmm. i am holding and hoping to put the guard on so my question is is there any way to fix my my bite because i think my bite is off well, yes. Uh, for, I mean, okay. Doctor Jagwe, um, if I may say, sir. Yes. I think we're going to take this off. Um, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I don't think we should okay. be kindly, kindly private. I'm chat. sorry. No, no, yeah. no. Don't be sorry. Let me tell don't you why. Put it's your, becoming personal. Yes. Everybody does not need to get into you. Yes, that's that's so why. So private I, chat me, please. Okay. And see, Dr. Jagwe feels the same way. He said he was going to suggest similar. I was just going to tell you, I think you shouldn't be discussing details of your condition uh, on a public forum <clears throat> like Medical Mondays. If you need additional 
input, you can reach out to Dr. O and then he, she knows how to get you the information that you need. No, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know, sorry. No, 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 no. it's for your own privacy. It's not, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. confidential. It's not something, that's why HIPAA is there. You don't talk about everybody's business openly. Yeah, so please private chat me, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay? Just private okay, chat thank me you, your, thank your you. number. Sorry, thank private you. Chat me, private chat me your number and I'll reach out to you and we'll discuss this. We want to protect you and your privacy is why. I got it, thank you. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Dr. Booker. Kindly unmute and ask your question. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, you muted. You muted, sis. Oh, okay. Yeah. You've talked, Professor, you spoke about the pacifier. And people say that you should use the pacifier and avoid the child sucking the thumb. But then you didn't give good things about the pacifier. What do you say about that? compared to sucking the thumb, sucking the thumb. Mm. I will tell you one thing. Um, that I, you, you, may, you may not see this in literature, but I, from my own observation, okay. Sucking the thumb may actually be a, a, a natural, uh, instinct for the body to grow the jaw. I've seen children that could have had crowding of teeth, but because of their habit, actually grew their jaw in the front so that they do not have crowding just from the habit. Now, when they overgrow the jaw in the front, that can be corrected by pushing it back a little bit. So in, a, in, a, in effect, when, the, when a child does that, you know, we actually tell patients when they have pushed in tooth to use something to, pull, to exert force over time, and that tooth, which is only one tooth, can move into the right place. So I'm trying to say that even though that has not been a study, a studied area of dentistry, but I, I, from a personal experience, I can say that that seems to be like a natural uh, instinct for that child to grow the jaw. Now, I would say that using pacifier initially looked like a very good idea until the trend became very obvious. The trend is that the children that have been left on pacifier for a steady period of time cannot avoid crowding, cannot avoid problem with the tongue, cannot avoid mouth breathing. Majority of them end up having respiratory uh, distress or the respiratory problem long term. So it's a it's a matter of you deciding what, which one would you prefer? Would you prefer a, 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 pro, a, you know, a protracted tooth because of thumb sucking that can be corrected easily without any uh, chest, in, you know, lung infection or a lung problem? Or would you rather have a way more complicated, you know, um, outcome uh, in the in the area of pacifier, you know the pacifier not only causes problem with with the lungs due to aspiration, it also causes, you know, because most mothers would dip it in something sweet so the baby will not throw it out, so they dip it into all this sugary stuff and put it in the baby's mouth. The baby keeps sucking it because they want the baby to be used to sucking the the uh, the pacifier, but. Research has documented it very clearly that long-term use of pacifier is dangerous, not to the child right now, but for the future. So it is best not to do it at all. If I'm gonna give an advice to a new mother, do not give your child pacifier. No, do not. 
When the baby needs to nurse, nurse the baby naturally. Avoid using, you know, bottles if you can. But if the baby does not get enough breast milk, yes, of course, you have to supplement by giving, you know, uh, any kind of, any, any supplement that will make the baby to be well fed. Okay. But pacifier is not your child's friend. It's, it's an enemy. I know the manufacturers will be very upset if they had that. But to tell the truth, if the, if the short-term effect seems to be good, but the long-term effect is very detrimental, I would not, I would not side on that. I would not be on that side of uh, pacifier use. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so very much, Dr. Jagwe. You're welcome. And uh, Damien is agreeing with you that pacifiers do more harm than good. Yes. Yeah. So if you leave us with your parting words for tonight, that would be fantastic. But before you do that, I would like to give an update on Dr. Wale Akose. Um, I was waiting to see how much we collected. I want to say thank you to our Medical Mondays family. This has become a family. It makes gives me so much joy that we get each other's backs in different ways on the platform and outside the platform, everywhere. And you know, um, I, I am grateful that we just love each other on this platform like that. Um, the Nigerian Center is the one we're contributing the money to so that everyone can have tax deductible contributions when they contribute. Some people are still donating. Um, and um, I was looking at my text message because I thought I wanted to get an update on how much we have collected so far. But believe it or not, it's been, it will, it will be 30 days um, on the 11th in two days since Dr. Akose wanted to commit suicide. And that, you know, uh, the Lord just intervened for us. I can't believe that time has flown so much. And we are still looking for a permanent residence for him. So um, we are going to extend his stay at the Extended Stay America. And so we want to thank you, everyone on this platform, for your assistance because we'll be able to pay that. But it's possible, please pray. It is possible that you may get a place tomorrow. Uh, we are hopeful at a lead for tomorrow. I will continue to update you. Um, if that does not pan out, then we have enough money to extend the, day, the his stay for another 30 days while we keep looking. And if anybody knows anyone who can accommodate Wally, he's an amazing young man. Um, and he is ready to work also. So much he can do. Uh, if you know anyone, kindly reach out to me um, so that uh, we can make that happen. Uh, it's, I am actually stopping him from engaging in working right now because he's still, he, he, I can see his anxiety about getting a permanent place. And I feel that we need to get him a place, let him have peace of mind, and then he can you know, start working again. I don't know if you, if you were not on the platform, this is a man who has written apps that were on Apple and Android and you know, um, just doing fantastic, uh, just intelligent, has amazing skills. And you know, uh, some misdiagnosis caused him to have kidney failure that he has been on dialysis for seven years. We're praying also that, you know, he can get kidney transplant and that can change also. But I'll keep you updated. Um, the next 24, 48 hours are critical, and uh, but they're not that critical because we have a way out because of you all. Thank you again. And I wanted to say, uh, Wale actually told me also, if you'd like to have personal contact, you know, um, engage him, talk to him. We all need, we are a village. Please let me know so that I can share his contact. 
I can actually share it now and you can reach out to him if you would like to. Thank you. Dr. Jagbe, over to you. Okay. Um, um, before Dr. Jagbe closes, I'm so sorry, um, Dr. O. I did post a question in the um, chat room. I don't know whether you already read it. I'm it was, sorry. Which one was, was it? It was going with that chewing thing, whether the chewing, the sponge can also help with teeth movement. Because I think when we get older, our teeth moved, right, Dr. Ajagbe? So can that help? Okay. With that? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, the movement that you want is not what some people are getting as they get older. Uh, as we get older, you see some people actually have uh, their diastema, that is the gap between their front teeth, getting wider. That's not the kind of movement that we need. That actually causes them to lose those teeth prematurely because whatever is causing their, you know, their chewing uh, on hard stuff, that's good. But the more that the gap continues to get wider, uh, the, the worse it will be for their teeth. Now, if you have crowded teeth, and while you are chewing on this uh, sponge, your teeth are becoming, you know, I mean, your jaw is getting stimulated to get wider and then your teeth get more room. That is perfect. Uh, so if that's the question that you are asking, yes, it is worth trying. It's not something dangerous. So you, if you know you have crowded teeth now and you want the teeth to become uh, spaced out over time, as you get older, yes, I think chew sponge can be one way to, to do it. The reason chew sponge uh, will be preferred over the chewing stick is that the chew sponge doesn't require as much force as the uh, chewing stick when you want to begin to get the pulp. So that first step has been done for you by getting the sponge in the, in the texture that it sees. So when you chew on the sponge, you're not doing anything extra. You're just kind of uh, making it uh, malleable enough for you to be able to use uh, wet. Because you are, what you are basically doing is you are mixing it with saliva. Saliva has um, antibacterial effect, also has uh, enzymes that can be breaking down any kind of carbohydrate that is in the, in the uh, fiber. And that can also uh, reduce the, uh, the kind of uh, acidogenic, you know, I mean, the formation of acid in the mouth. And that's what that old lady was saying when she was bringing it out and saying that, oh, she can't eat, do anything, you know, any morning without chewing that uh, sponge. Because it's good for cleaning their tongue and they don't swallow the spit. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. If you want to uh, uh, you know, see improvement in the crowding of your teeth, I think it's worth trying. Thank you very much, sir. Ashik. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So parting words, right? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, um, I, I, as usual, I'm very, I'm very grateful that uh, so many people feel engaged. Uh, with this topic and, you know, so many of the questions actually bring out more things, just like this uh, chew sponge. I mean, that was just uh, a very big eye opener. Um, I've, you know, I've shared it before to some people that using the ordinary sponge that we have in Nigeria to clean the teeth is not out of the, um, out of the extraordinary. You could do it, you know, just like you could use a washcloth. So the goal is this. We want the mother to have a um, healthy mouth. We want the children to have healthy mouths. If, it, if it's a newborn, we know, as Dr. O said, it's, you know, she discourages mothers from kissing the baby right on the mouth. Um, well, although some, you know, it shows some kind of affection, but from all that we've discussed today, it's better not to do it. It's better to abstain from doing such. 
because the child is being contaminated. Uh, imagine a child just being born, the, most of the parts of the body inside is sterile until it's in contact with the physical, the outside, either through sucking the mother's breast, because there's no amount of cleaning that can remove all the bacteria from the mother's skin. So we, the child has already been exposed to that from the mother. Now to add more from the mother's mouth to picking up um, pacifiers from the ground and you know, adding more, you know, complicating it more from the mother's mouth and putting it back into the baby's mouth with sugary, uh, you know, nutritional stuff, food or drink, that is not looking good for any, any little baby. So we need to you know, be mindful of this. It, many of us are no longer childbearing, uh, at uh, the childbearing age now, but we know other people who are the childbearing age. We need to oh, encourage them. What about grandchildren? Yes, we need to encourage them. We need to educate them. Um, I, I think this is one of those things that, you know, should be, you know, uh, shared among women in women's uh, meetings and women's uh, clubs, because most of these things are not easily, you know, thought about and uh, they have long lasting effect deleteriously on the, on the, uh, the outcome in children. So, I think we should just, re if we don't remember anything, let's just remember the ones for the children, that we want the children's oral health to be tip top. We want them to be healthy, not just in their mouth, but overall. Imagine a child who is, already, you know, who at the age of six is already having a lot of infection from gum disease and from cavities. What is it doing to the child's heart? Do we know? What is it doing to their blood pressure? Do we know? Because every time they are anxious about the toothache, uh, what is it doing to them? We talk about the um, sympathetic drive, you know, the fight, fright, or flight kind of situation that they get into every time there is adverse uh, event. So these are the things that we need to bear in mind. Uh, the children need us. Uh, we need to encourage the mothers, the brand new mothers or mothers to be, uh, to take care of their, you know, children by taking care of themselves first, having good oral health. They will not be passing on everything else to their baby, either by, you know, what they chew on, or you know, sometimes we chew on some food to give to babies because they say, oh, the baby doesn't have teeth, so you chew, mm, and then you give to the baby. The baby enjoys it to say, give me more. <laughs> so we don't know that we are mixing all kinds of things with the, such food that we're giving to the baby. But, you know, uh, ignorance is not an excuse uh, to the consequence. So there is no way we can avoid, I mean, we can escape some of these dire consequences if we ignore them. Thank you very much for your attention. And I wish everybody. A, a very pleasant evening until we meet again. Thank you. And Dr. Jagwe is right. Thank you so much. Till we meet again next week, please stay safe. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jagwe, thank you for the excellent presentation and all that you opened our eyes to again. You're <laughs> welcome. God bless you, sir. You're and welcome. Till we meet again next week, please be safe. COVID is raging again. It's spreading and the strain we have now is different um, despite immunization. So please be safe. God bless you all. Welcome.